Welcome to Masters of Product Management, powered by Sequent Learning Networks, a show that provides extraordinary insights for product managers who want to go faster and farther in their product management careers. Welcome to the Masters of Product Management, powered by Sequent Learning Networks, and I'm Stephen Haynes, and I'll be your host today. So, over the past year, um, I have extended my exercise routine um, to include, get this, spin classes. All right. Now, how I got to this point is just so like a completely other conversation. But um, the point for me is that I love the workout. And so, so here's the other one, right? I'm burning a lot of calories. But for me, that translates into the fact that I could go and get a permission slip to eat more food. But um, beyond that, and all kidding aside, um, here in New York City, there are lots of spin studios, and the two biggest ones are SoulCycle and Flywheel. And both brands are extremely well positioned, very well targeted. It's clear what each of those firms stands for. So now for this, I've always known that spin studios were out there, probably more than several, two decades, I'm, I'm sure of this. And, and some of those studios have, um, have classes that have really elevated the user or the writer experience. And I, you all know this, I'm a product guy. And I became really interested in learning more about these brands and how they got started, and of course, how they scaled. And so recently, I was introduced to Ruth Zuckerman. And Ruth just finished a, a book. It's called Riding High, How I Kissed Soul Cycle Goodbye and Co-Founded Flywheel and Built the Life I Always Wanted, which is, I mean, we all aspire to, to that, right? Um, and Ruth is, is an indoor cycling pioneer, and she's the co-founder and creative director of Flywheel. And she is the driving force behind one of the nation's most effective, empowering works on workouts. And I will attest to that because I love Flywheel. So, Ruth, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Stephen. It's an honor to be here. Well, it's great. Now, I, I have loved our chats in the, in, in the past, and I, of course, love your classes. Um, I find you incredibly inspiring. And so for the listeners, just to let you know, she really is one of the most amazing flywheel, uh, literally, facilitators I've, I've ever experienced. Um, anyway, so with this, as we discussed, it's true. It's true. You're, Thank you're amazing. You. I mean, and I sweat a lot, and you make me work. So, <laughs> and then, and then. And they put my name up on that board, and I go, oh my God, <laughs> such a loser. <laughs> Never. You do very well, Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, so, so as, as we discussed, our listeners are, are product managers and marketers and, and other business people. We in the product space always wonder about, it's like the spark of inspiration and that motivation, that big idea that could change or disrupt the market. So I would love if you could share with us a little bit about your background and how you got involved initially in SoulCycle. Absolutely. Uh, I started out as a dancer. I was a modern dancer uh, through most of my life from age eight through college and decided I would dance professionally in New York right after school. Well, that proved to be quite challenging and difficult and competitive. I knew I wanted to be in New York, the most competitive city. I didn't want to leave. And long story short, about a, two years of dancing for no money, I realized I had to give it up and I had to find something else. And I I say it very um, kind of nonchalantly, but the truth is it was a huge decision for me. It was something mm. I devoted my life to and suddenly get, gave it up. And never in a million years did I ever imagine finding something else I would be equally passionate about. Um, I eventually, through some awful experiences in office jobs, found the world of fitness and um, specifically aerobics. And I started teaching aerobic slash dance fitness in the early 80s on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Grapevine. Yes, it's pretty <laughs> fine, exactly. And actually, that led to step classes where you do a great fine. And um, oh, is that it? I'm sorry. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. And um, that's kind of how I uh, got into the fitness world, and it made sense for me because clearly I, I needed to do something physical after leaving the dance uh, mm -hmm. world, and so it, it made sense, and I enjoyed it. And uh, and so that's how I got into it, and then I got married at the age of 26 and uh, 
a few years later, had twin girls and pretty much stopped working. And uh, things didn't go as expected uh, round two um, Mm -hmm. and ended up getting divorced. And I left the marriage with six-year-old twin girls and hadn't been in the workforce and thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to support myself? Um, Simultaneous to that time, sorry about that, I... um, I was taken to a spin class. A friend of mine was taking classes and said, oh, you should try this. It's really fun. And I was intimidated first. I would walk by this dark room in a gym where it was crowded and everyone was like spinning furiously. But something in me said, okay, let's just give it a shot. And literally within the first class, I was hooked. I noticed immediately that there was something about this form of exercise that had not only the physical component, but an emotional component to it. And at the end of the 45 minutes, it, it was very cathartic for me. Um, there I was going through a very difficult time, you know, traumatic experience. And at the end of the class, I felt, I don't know, more powerful and, and both physically and mentally. And, Mm -hmm. And therefore, it became addicting very quickly and addictive very quickly. And Mm -hmm. uh, I started going very frequently. And the other huge difference about this, quote unquote, exercise class was that it didn't feel like an exercise class to me. It felt more like an experience. There was something about the importance of the music, the instructor's playlist. The movement on the bike was actually choreographed to the music. So... Again, there were many components about it that I could relate to as a dancer. Um, I grew up loving music, um, surrounded by music in my family. And here I was, you know, in this exercise class that where music was incredibly integral to the experience. So, again, mm-hmm. got hooked really quickly. And um, this first spin instructor of mine, who I was very attached to, announced one day he was picking up and moving to Florida. And I really thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? I, <laughs> how am I going to go on? Because as you know, you get attached to certain instructors. And um, you, I really didn't really care for the other instructors at this gym. And so my logical conclusion was, okay, I'm going to have to start teaching myself. I'll just teach my own classes. And I told them I wanted to audition. And within two minutes, they said, you're hired. And that's where I started my teaching career. I was at the Reebok Club on the Upper West Side. Oh, sure. I, I taught there for five years, built a following. And during those five years, I really kind of start to hone my own way of teaching the class and started to see what people responded to and what they liked and what they didn't like. And sure enough, during the course of the five years, the lines for my class to sign up for my class were getting longer and longer. And one day, five years in, a woman approached me. She was a regular rider in my class and said, I want to open up a boutique spin studio dedicated only to spin in in New York. And I know nothing about teaching. Um, Um, but I love your class and I would love you to be the creative force behind this business and the face of the business. And I literally, you know, within 30 seconds said, done, I'm in. It was really my dream come true. It was something I'd been wanting to do for a while, didn't have the capital, didn't know how to get it. And again, it really was my dream come true. And then that became the beginnings of Soul Cycle. That is, that is beyond an amazing story and you know what's what's interesting um we we in product we very often try to talk about you know the customer or the user journey and um one of the things that i try to to do in in my workshops and working with my clients is how how do you get to to walk in the customer's shoes or to cycle in the customer's shoes, if you if you will. Mm-hmm. And what's really interesting about what you're saying is that as a customer, right, and as a client, and as somebody who started to really feel that, it's almost like you had you empathize with yourself. hundred percent. It's amazing. We we want people to empathize with their customers in in who are these people who work in these gigantic corporations, and it's like. It's, it's almost like they're talking a foreign language because yeah. everything is so muted. And, and here it is, you're right on the ground or right on the bike, however you want to talk yeah. about it. Mm-hmm. So 
That's exactly right. And I just want to add to, I just want to add to that and say that, you know, I'm often asked what motivated, you know, Ruth, what motivated you to, to take this business to the level that you did. And the, the answer to that is that as a writer, as a customer, I experienced, you know, this incredible, um, I had this incredible experience with it. And, you know, I talked about how cathartic it was and how it got me through so much. And truthfully, my prime motivation was that I just wanted to spread the wealth and I wanted to bring this to a much larger group of people. And that's, there's a genuineness, right? You know, when, when, when we look at markets and we look at competing companies and you know they talk a good game about how to differentiate themselves and how to stand out from the crowd and it just seems like you found almost this natural formula to differentiate yourself and built your following around that which is it, it is remarkable and i i know that there are lots of spin instructors in in all the you know some not all but some of the competing brands and they all have their followings but you were a trendsetter Yes. And and in, in in that it's a it's it's quite amazing, um, but th- there are some other things that you know we we sort of look at this the broader you know how you found your fit, mm-hmm. but when you get inside of a business and you're getting you know it's you know from my own experience it's really hard to start a company and sustain a company and to grow a company, and. The, you you get into the day to day stuff. It's not that you're on the platform, so to speak. It's it's that you're you're in the office and you're working with people. What could you talk a little bit about? You know, especially as product people. Um, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges that you have or had in terms of things like teams or roles or collaboration? You know, in these sort of earlier days and how you evolved in your career. Truthfully, I. Uh we didn't have that many challenges with our team. And here's why Um, my co-founders and I, and as cheesy as this might sound, Mm -hmm. the three of us were and are really nice people. And so we led from a place of kindness and I'm pointing this out because you know, as I go on in my experiences in business and with various different businesses I've worked with and people I've come into contact with, you don't always see that. And so mm. from the get go, we treated our employees and our customers exactly the same way with the same importance and the same energy. And as a result, Everybody wanted it to work. Everyone wanted this business to succeed, not just the employees, but the customers too, because they were loving it so much. And um, we, you know, when our employees, let's say, screwed up, made mistakes, we didn't get down on them. We sat with them and we said, okay, let's figure out why this happened and let's figure out how to not repeat it, you know, and we didn't discourage them or make them feel inadequate, which I see sometimes in other businesses Mm -hmm. and it's so destructive and, you know, to a certain extent, we, we treated our employees like family and, um, the result was nothing but incredibly positive. And, you know, as you, as you would figure, you get your employees to have the same passion for your business that you do. Yeah. And, and that is, I mean, literally, that's true leadership. <clears throat> and what's also interesting, I mean, they're, they're in, in big corporate world, especially companies that they have, they, they have um, traditional products and they have digital products and, and, and services and software. And, but everybody's saying we got to go faster. We have to work in these, these sort of agile teams, they call it, yes. that are able to, to literally um, pivot on a dime. And what you're describing is sort of that small, smaller company familial um, environment that is that that's the holy grail of people in larger companies. They want sort of mini versions of those cross functional teams exactly. um, that will will gain and exude passion. And, and, and of course, it's very, very hard, but we always study and examine how do people like you and how do companies like yours become successful and scale. And I think this, what you talk about, and I, and even took, I, I had to write notes cause I, otherwise I forget. Right. But you know, mm-hmm. passion, you talk about emotions, mm-hmm. you know, leading, leading from a place of kindness, vested interests. Holy smokes. That is, that is, that's the secret sauce. 
It right. really is. And it, it really, it got to the point where, um, you know, my co-founder Jay and I worked very closely together uh, during the first four years of the business. And, you know, just for example, I just turned 60 and, and Jay right now is 42. So disparate in age. Yet that being said, we were literally referred to by all of our employees as mom and dad. And yeah. it, literally, <laughs> and we got such a kick out of that, but it, it really was part of the reason for our success. It's like, that's how comfortable they felt with us as, and we were their bosses, obviously. But there was just a total comfort level. We were approachable. We were forgiving. We um, gave people second chances. We gave people who were maybe on the lower end of the totem pole opportunities that, you know, other companies might not give to, again, at the end of the day, make, make everyone feel really important. This is, this is beyond, beyond amazing. So tell us a little bit about this book and why you wrote it and, and who's it targeted for? Yes. Uh, it's funny. I was on the phone today with a potential publicist to help me with the book. And she obviously asked me that question. What is your motivation behind the book? And the first thing I said was, I said, look, I understand in this day and age, people don't necessarily write books to make money. Um, and that, I can attest to that. Yes, I know. <laughs> and that certainly was not my motivation. My motivation, again, was to kind of have a different platform on which to spread the wealth. Just as I told you previously in this interview, I wanted to spread the wealth when it, it had such an uh, enormous effect on me. And now I want to do it through my book. And that was really the motivation to, to reach an even wider audience. I think mm-hmm. that there's a huge net that I cast with this book. I think it can reach both men and women. I think there might be, it might skew a little more toward women, but you know, whether it's uh, single mothers, uh, whether it's artists who suddenly give up their field and they don't know what to do next, whether it's people who need to reinvent themselves, people who never thought in a million years they could start a new successful business at the age of 51, um, Mm -hmm. as I did, uh, like that. I mean, it kind of goes on and on. And um, really, I wanted it to be a a, a book of inspiration for people to know that they can go on and they can start again. And people who get divorced and think, Oh my God, what am I going to do next? I haven't worked in 10 years. I, I just, as again, again, I just think it casts a really wide net. Yeah. You know what, what you, what you talk about it's, is really, I mean, again, we talk about what, what are people looking for in, in, in their careers and in their, in their lives and things like that. And uh, it, it, it's astonishing how you've tied it together by telling the story, and you are a great storyteller as well. And we, we in, in in our universal product management talk about this this idea of storytelling, and storytelling is a way to um, literally um, convey the passion and convey the empathy and convey the emotion of your customers, right? Mm-hmm. Because yes. our job as business people is to uncover the the needs that they may not even know that they have. Mm -hmm. And that because we are experiencing it, we say, wow, maybe we hypothesize and say, hmm, maybe there's something else that's out there. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it's like, you know, you you try to light the match and you you strike it and you strike it and you strike it and all of a sudden it flares. And the the heart of of inspiration and and building differential advantage and all those those innovation things that people talk about are are rooted in everything that you've talked about um, in in this program. And I am both both grateful and thankful um, that you're able to share this story with me and with our listeners. And, and also because you, you, the whole world is opening up to you now, whether it's through your TV um, appearances and, and even when you're on the platform and, and getting people motivated and they're going to be lining up out the door, they're going to have to put like 300 bikes in the room. For you. <laughs> As my grandmother used to say, uh, from your mouth to God's ears. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was just like, I had this strange idea, right? You know, you're going to have a, a flyathon, and you're going to get a stadium, like giant stadium, and you're going to put 
10,000 bikes in there and you're going to run the craziest ride. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. I'd love to have that opportunity. <laughs> Holy smokes what you could do. Anyway, um, this, this again, thank you for an amazing conversation. And, and for, for our listeners, I really hope that you've learned much um, from a business pioneer and how we as product people can think of ways to disrupt the world of, of product. So at any rate, that's our show for today. Please tell your friends and colleagues and be sure to tune in next time on Masters of Product Management. I'm Stephen Haynes. Bye now. You've been listening to Masters of Product Management, powered by Sequent Learning Networks. If you'd like to take your career to the next level with additional tools, training, coaching, and books, be sure to visit Sequent Learning Networks at sequentlearning.com. <laughs>